Now, it was Bobby Lashley winning the TNA World Heavyweight Championship that brought me back to watching Impact to reviewing Impact. But one of the things I'm looking for is for TNA to just give me a better show. They don't have to knock it out of the park every week, but they need to do better. And I will give them credit. This week, I thought they did better. When I saw Kurt Angle was coming out to kick off Impact, I'm sitting there saying to myself, well, you know, he's probably going to set the table for this show. He's probably going to set the table for next week. It is what it is. But please don't let this be 15 or 20 minutes of jibber-jabber, jibber-jabber. And thankfully, it wasn't. You have Angle get his point across, set the table for the night, then out comes Joe, and that's when I thought things were going to get really long and really monotonous, which is what I complain about a lot with Raw every week, is that the opening promo segment is the same type of thing for 15 minutes. TNA, though, got a lot done here. They set the table for a lot of different things, and the whole opening segment, I think, took seven or eight minutes. You know, I don't have a beef with opening promo segments. To me, though, it's a matter of getting the most you can out of it in the least amount of time and then get underway with the show. And I thought TNA did a good job with that, with Impact this week. And I also love the tease of Samoa Joe potentially having something bigger in store for him down the road. One consistent complaint I have about TNA because they consistently do this is the overuse of the hardcore or extreme stipulations, in particular with matches where they have absolutely no business incorporating those hardcore or extreme stipulations. Now you had two kind of hardcore or extreme rules type of matches on this show. You had Kenny King versus Bobby Roode in a street fight and EC3 versus Bully Ray in a tables match. However, at least I will say this, even though I don't like the fact that they had a street fight and a tables match on the show, at least both stories going into these matches could justify or necessitate, based off of the way they were presented and structured, having some type of hardcore or extreme stipulation attached here. And, you know, this kind of goes back again into the whole thing of, you know, TNA really values the rating more than they do the pay-per-view, so they seem to love to throw these things at the television show every week, not so much the pay-per-view. As far as Kenny King versus Bobby Roode, what I really liked about this is the fact that Kenny King wasn't afraid, that Kenny King was basically egging Bobby Roode on, that Kenny King was going toe-to-toe -to -toe and standing face-to-face -face with Bobby Roode and said, no, fuck you. I want this just as bad as you do. In a world of professional wrestling today, especially where we see far too many cookie cutters or chicken shit, turn away, run and hide heels. It's a very refreshing thing to see, especially when a company does that with a black heel. By God, he's not rapping, he's not dancing, he's not doing any of that crap. This is just a legit serious competitor, and I really like that. And I thought the King Rude Street Fight came across really well, especially because it was several minutes before they even got into the ring to actually start the fight. You know, they actually were out there fighting like you would in a street fight, and I really like that. And when it comes to EC3 and Bully Ray, you know, the story is all leading to the eventuality of whether or not Dixie is or is not going to go through a table. Um, I, I, bringing in Rhino, though, do we really need to do that? And is every match that Bully Ray is going to have be a tables match now? I mean, I'm okay with having him sometimes. I'm understanding that that's his baby, that's his thing. And I don't have a problem with that being his baby or that being his thing. But again, when you overuse these stipulations, eventually they start to lose their meaning and their significance, even if they are immediately identified with a particular individual. A couple of other side things that I liked on this show this week. Number one, I liked the thing with Gunner and Samuel Shaw. Now, I didn't watch the period of impact where this storyline was kind of developing, apparently, with Samuel Shaw being in the asylum and Gunner being there for him. I like how they're kind of playing off of the fact that, you know, Gunner was in the military with guys that, you know, had these type of problems when they came back. You know, this is something that is potentially heavy hitting. You know, somebody just needs a friend. Maybe they're misunderstood. You know, and it's to me more so an attempt to tell a story with a character in the case of Samuel Shaw. So I'm at least interested to see where they go with it from here. The other thing I really liked was the back and forth in this little pre taped segment with Kurt Angle and Austin Aries. It planted the seed potentially for a Kurt Angle Austin Aries match down the road, which I'm sure everybody would be fine with. 
It also planted the seeds of reminding you again that Destination X is coming up at the end of the month, that Austin Aries was the one a couple of years ago that created Option C, cashed in his X Division title, and became the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. So you've planted that seed that Austin Aries can do that again. You're also building up to the Destination X show at the end of the month. You're also setting the table for next week, saying that he gets a shot against Sonata at the X Division title. You know, some simple stuff. I'm not sure if I heard this right during the show, and one of you can let me know one way or another in the comments, or I'm sure many of you will. Uh, did I hear that right, that next week every title is on the line? I didn't know. Because it almost felt like just about every title here, except the X Division title, was on the line this week. Uh, you had three title defenses on this show. Now, I'm okay with defending a title here on TV and defending a title there on TV, but I don't know if you need to have three of them on the same show. It was my only thing, because you know those title matches kind of tend to blend together on television, and if you have a title change, and in particular it's not a world title change, then it kind of gets lost in the schmas a little bit. So that was one question I had about this week's show, was why did you have to sit there and have three title matches? Was that really necessary? Am I the only one that feels like the Wolves have kind of gotten lost in the shuffle here a little bit during the summer? You know, this is really a time where they should be feuding with a quality tag team, a quality heel tag team. This is where you really notice the absence on the roster of, let's say, bad influence. Because Edwards and Richards versus Kaz and Daniel seems to have a lot of appeal to it, at least to me, and I'm sure a lot of you as well. Instead, you've got the Wolves kind of, like I said, just floating in the breeze here. A triple threat tag team championship match. You've got the Bromans, and then you've got two people from the Menagerie, and you give them like four minutes. This was just not good. And again, it's a shame because you've got this great tag team and you don't have any real credible rivals on the other side. And again, maybe this is where my disappointment comes in from not bringing together uh, beer money back to have a real quality tag team feud over the belts for the summer. One thing you're trying to do, I guess, with Kurt Angle being kind of a babyface authority figure is you're trying to bring back some logic and some common sense into things, maybe. And that would explain maybe why all of a sudden Stifler is not going to be allowed uh, to referee Angelina Love's title defense against Gail Kim. Hey, whatever, that's fine. We don't need that stupid ref angle anyways. Let's get the fuck away from that. But ultimately, you know, this match between Gail Kim and Angelina Love for the knockouts title. Been there, seen it so many times. Gail Kim wins the knockouts title. Hey, I'm not really a fan of hers. And B, even if I was, I'd even have to sit there and say at some point in time, this shit gets old. It's the same old stuff with this knockouts division. And it's funny. I cared very little about the knockouts title and even less about the title change. I was much more captivated about what went on between Madison Rain and Brittany. I thought this was outstanding. You know, and what Brittany said was so true, you know, about you don't want to meet your heroes because basically they'll end up disappointing you. And her turn here on Madison made for actual good television. I really wish, frankly, that this was a feud over the Knockouts title, not Gail Kim versus Angelina Love. Main event for Impact on Thursday was the TNA World Heavyweight Championship match between Eric Young and Bobby Lashley. The first thing I like about this is the fact that the world title match main evented this show. That's a positive. Number two, the question I have about this is you had Lashley win the belt a couple weeks ago, and in terms of a presentation standpoint, you're really not making Bobby Lashley feel all that much like a world champion. It's like he's the world champion, but, you know, he's got the belt, but. We're going to focus on this guy, and we're going to focus on that guy. And I don't think they've done a good enough job up to this point of actually getting you really engaged into Bobby Lashley, a battle toad, the destroyer Lashley, um, in terms of his character as the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. But the one thing that I do really like, I guess number three here, the major point, is that I love the fact that he is a believable heel world champion, and he is winning matches clean. He wins the belt on impact clean, and he defends his title successfully against Eric Young 100% clean, as exactly he freaking should. And that, above anything else to me, can sweep any of that other stuff potentially under the rug, at least for the short term. You've got a monster heel champion. Instead of going out of your way to make him seem incredibly cowardly and incredibly chicken shit like you did with a Magnus, you are actually attempting to establish Bobby Lashley 
as a bad, legitimate badass. You had him beat Samoa Joe clean at Slammiversary. You have him go on into the world title match at that pay-per-view. Then he comes back on Impact, and he beats Eric Young clean for the title. Here's his title defense against Eric Young, and he beats him clean again. This is actually good booking. This, to me, is the type of booking we need for more heel world champions in professional wrestling today. You know, I understand sometimes heels need to cheat. I understand sometimes that heels need to be cowards. I understand sometimes that heels need to turn and run to get some heat on them. But sometimes the best way to get heat on them is to make them so badass that it seems like nobody can beat them. And I hope that's the path that they're going down with Bobby Lashley. I'm hedging my bets fully on that happening at the moment because I'm not sure that they're fully bought in long term to having Lashley be the champion. But at the moment, I've liked what they've done from an in-ring standpoint, if nothing else, with them. So was this a perfect show? No. Was this a good show? Yes. Was this the type of stuff that I'm looking for from TNA going forward to get me re-engaged in their product, to get me re-engaged in Impact every week, get me a little more passionate about the company and their product and their performers? Yes. So in general, from my standpoint and my opinion only, I felt this was a very productive, successful episode of Impact.